All right, it's time for our preaching. Let's open our Bibles to the Old Testament prophet Joel. The prophet Joel, the small little book. So Joel chapter 3, if you will, please, as we begin. Joel chapter 3, and I'm going to start reading at verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people, and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. I'll stop right there. This is a perfectly clear text on the events of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Christ said, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and so forth. Matthew 24 Verse 29, the battle of Armageddon is laid out here between the forces of the world and the forces of heaven. Verse 9 says, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. The Bible says, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, Revelation 17, verses 13 and 14. Verse 11 here says, Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Those mighty ones are detailed back in Joel 2, the first 11 verses specifically. If you want to read that uh, on your own time. It's a great description of an invincible, indestructible army of troops coming to wage war against the world. The Bible says the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Revelation 19, verse 14. I mean, if you're saved, you expect to be part of that army someday. I'm looking forward to that day. What a lot of fun that's going to be for us, huh? And the world will try to withstand an invasion from outer space. All of their science fiction stories and movies will finally be realized, but it won't be the friendly Sky Brothers who have been watching out for us coming to help them out. It'll be an onslaught that they never imagined. And the Lord's judgment is described as stomping grapes in a wine press. Verse 13, Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. Their fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. The Bible says the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and, the, and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Revelation 14, verse 19. And again, then God finally settles the question of the Holy Land and who it truly belongs to. He calls out the heathen. In uh, verse 9, he calls them the Gentiles. And then he refers to them as heathen in verse 11. Notice verses 16 and 17 again. 
The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. You know, the Lord goes so far as to say, And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Uh, Zechariah 14, verse 21. No more Muslims, no more Islam, uh, no more uh, uh, Arabic nations that have been corrupted and contaminated by Islam over the centuries. Think about this. When the Lord Jesus Christ begins to reign over planet Earth, there won't be any more Islam. Islam, the Muslim religion, won't exist anymore. And I might say neither will Buddhism, neither will Hinduism, Neither will all the New Age religions, neither will Roman Catholicism. There won't be any more popes pretending to be Jesus Christ in a funny costume. There won't be any more uh, fighting among Protestant denominations. Only those who were redeemed and uh, have been transformed and regenerated by the power of Jesus Christ, coming back as glorified saints, and those who were obedient during the tribulation who survived into the millennium, those will be the only ones here. It's hard to wrap your mind around the fact that everybody in the world who belongs to some other religious idea that does not include the new birth won't be here anymore. But it's true. But I want to spring from verse 14, if I can today. There have been a lot of great evangelistic sermons preached from the language of verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the Valley of Decision. Joshua issued a challenge. Joshua 24, verse 15. Choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God stated, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Genesis 6 verse 3. God said in the book of Psalms, Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Psalm 95 verses 8 and 9. No matter how many miracles God performed to sustain and protect Israel during their wilderness journeys, they'd find some new reason to complain and some new reason to doubt him. God couldn't seem to win with Israel in the wilderness. But as far as that reaction goes, everybody can be like that from time to time. There's a story of the Sunday school teacher. She had a little group of about, I don't know, kindergarten first graders in her class. And she's saying, now, boys and girls, the Bible says God cannot look upon our sin. The Bible says God cannot lie. Is there anything else you think God can't do? A little girl raises her hand and says, Yes, ma'am. My daddy says, God can't seem to please everybody either. That's very true. That's very true. No matter how many miracles he performed, they'd find some new reason to doubt him and to complain. It's been said, Never put off until tomorrow what you ought to do today. So the Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Every sinner who hears the gospel of Jesus Christ offered and the chance to be saved is given to him now has a decision to make, to either believe it or to reject it. And in a verse that nearly describes the entire Bible. Acts 28, verse 24 says, And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. You could sum summarize almost the entire Bible with that verse. And in the verse that I quote more often than any other, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, verse 12. But of course, the context of Joel 3 
verse 14, is not a sinner deciding whether or not he's going to trust Jesus Christ. For him, that time will have already passed. Now it's the judge of the universe deciding what his fate is going to be coming out of the tribulation as Jesus Christ begins to reign in his kingdom. But the word multitude means many, like many people, many places, many things of some other kind. And so I've titled this sermon, The Multitudes in Your Life. The Multitudes in Your Life. And I'm not going to cite, or have you turn rather, to every text for every point, but I will cite them and read them to you. If you want to take notes, you can write them down, just for time's sake today. First of all, consider the multitude of years. The multitude of years. Psalm 90, verses 10 to 12. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, or seventy years. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, or eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And Job 32 Verses 6 and 7. And Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzite, answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. Wherefore, I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, Days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. We tend to think that older people have a lot more wisdom than we do. Some do, and some don't. They've certainly seen a lot more of life than we have, but have they learned anything from it? When you're young, your dad and mom pay for everything. They take care of you, and you have no idea how much things cost or how expensive things can be. And you can't figure out why they say no whenever you want to go to Disneyland or some special event. Or why can't we go to that nice restaurant the way Johnny's family gets to do? Or why can't we take that vacation the way Timmy's family did? Until you get your first job and learn, start learning how to manage your money, so then you realize why mom and dad had to say no more often than they probably wanted to say no. When you're young, especially if you're a young man, you might try to go too far with a girl. You think, well, if nobody finds out, then no harm is done. It's between her and me. It's our business. Until you get married and have children of your own. You better not try to touch my daughter the way I tried to touch someone else's daughter when I was and if you have any character at all, you would be disgraced if your son turned out to treat some girl the way you tried to treat someone, some girl when you were young. People tend to become more conservative as they get older in their conduct and their finances, but they don't always become wiser. There's a great chasm separating those two ideas. You see these men, they're in their late 60s, maybe early 70s, and uh, they're balding on top, but they've got this long gray ponytail, you know, and the back, of their Pri the back of their Prius has these bumper stickers of all the state beaches they've camped at, and they're, they're still voting for Democrats, right? <laughs> Bernie's going to take it this year. He's going to go all the way. The party of abortion the party of gay marriage, the party of banning plastic drinking straws, the party of free condoms to perverts and free syringes to drug users, the party of free health care to people who really aren't even supposed to be here, the, the, the party of banning capital punishment, the party of you know, LGBT, QRST, UV, WXYZ, the party of dead people who still vote in Chicago. And we might even add the party of the Ku Klux Klan. 
The Democrat Party was the party of the Ku Klux Klan back in the 1860s. People think somehow the Republican Party invented slavery. No. The Republican Party didn't even exist yet until 1853, and their number one objective, their number one goal, was to put an end to the black slavery here in America because the Democrats kept it going. And now kids in public schools have been conditioned to think that Republicans sort of invented slavery. They've got it all upside down these days. Some of these people, they may be older, but the multitude of years hasn't taught them any wisdom yet. After working in the funeral business, I've witnessed the funerals of many, many people in their late 80s, 90s, even over 100 years old, and there's no mention of God, there's no mention of prayer, there's no mention of the Savior, there's no mention of salvation, there's no mention of the Word of God, there's no mention of any hope in Jesus Christ at all. Some girl comes up to eulogize her grandma. Grandma was 103, and she celebrated every birthday with a shot of Jack Daniels. Her grandma taught me how to work the slot machine on my first trip to Vegas with her. Or if grandpa's in heaven, he'll be disappointed if he can't get a poker game, poker game going. A lot of nonsense. No mention of God or their soul or salvation at all. Some people live young as fools, and they seem to be determined to die as fools. We like to tell ourselves that old people, older people, let me say, have mellowed, and they're, they're naturally interested in God and spiritual things. It makes us feel good, but it may not be so. Some preacher can offer to come hold free chapel services in a nursing home. Some place has got 85, 90 residents living there, or some senior facility. He'll be lucky if he gets six people show up to the um, you know, conference room to do that. They weren't interested in God when they were younger. They've lived this long without church and God and salvation. Why do they need to be interested in God now? You can't depend on the multitude of years. The multitude of years can get in your way. Secondly, I want you to consider the multitude of words. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 2 and 3. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. That text defines a fool as someone who, who can't stop talking. He thinks he has something important to say about every issue, as if people were clamoring, demanding his opinion. Also, Proverbs 17, verse 28. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. There's an expression that says, Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. You really are a fool. The Bible says, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Proverbs 29, verse 20. Everybody's got an opinion on everything. Just ask them. But too many words, too many uh, voices, too many opinions from every quarter does nothing but confuse the important issues that you ought to be concerned with. There may be a factual sequence of events leading up to a car accident in an intersection, and you can find 10 bystanders who think they witnessed the whole thing and they know exactly what happened. All that does is confuses the issue and makes it more cloudy and more difficult to arrive at the truth. Think of this in a similar way. You and I believe one book is the Bible. And there's a multitude of modern versions out there claiming to be updated versions of the Bible. Improvements on the Bible. You ever notice the, the <coughs> clever trick that was pulled on the general public? It used to be the King James Bible. And over here you had the New American Standard Version. 
the new international version, and so forth. And now they're referred to as the new international Bible, the new American standard Bible, and opposed to the King James Version. They took the terms and they reversed them because the word Bible carries a, a measure of authority. A very sneaky trick they tried to pull on the public. Job told his friends, What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior to you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. Job 13, verses 2 to 5. You haven't said anything to me that I don't already know myself. Why don't you say something to help me? And if you can't, keep quiet. The multitude of words come to us now in a multitude of ways. There's old print newspaper, online newspaper, a million websites of one kind or another, email, text, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Netflix network or, or, or channel, um, Instagram, Facebook, Craigslist, Dr. Phil, your boss, your friends at work, and the guy that you see every morning at Starbucks. Everybody's got words they want to offer you, uh, and all that does is clutter your mind. It's coming at you from every direction. You, you ought to get in your car. You know, you get in your car to drive, and you instinctively turn on the radio to get some noise. Try this. Next time, don't. Don't be listening to anyone talking on the radio. Don't be listening to any traffic reports, KFWB traffic every seven minutes. Who cares? Listen, if you're not expecting traffic here in Southern California, you haven't been here very long, have you? You expect it, and you're relieved if there's not traffic. But drive for a while without listening to music and the voices of the announcers in between, or without listening to a multitude of stupid commercials uh, for x lax and everything else, without listening to you know, some news commentary. Just drive in silence and, and collect your thoughts. It'll be a real relief to you. From time to time, that's a good thing to do. All the words from coming to you from all the other places are, can, be, can be a distraction from you finding the important things with God the way you ought to. The Bible said of Christ, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Luke 4, verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2, verse 22. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. John 7, or John 6, uh, verse 68. The Pharisees asked, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. John 7, verse 46. There was never anything unkind, anything impure, anything false out of the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. John Wesley was in the habit of making conversation with you for about five minutes, and then he'd just walk away from you. Conversation's over. He would say, in the multitudes of words, there wanteth not sin. It can turn to gossip very quickly. But whoso refraineth his lips is wise. Proverbs 10, verse 19. So along with that, point number three, consider the multitude of counselors. Proverbs 11, verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. This is a well-known principle about getting as much information as you can before making a big decision. As a general rule, that's good advice. But even that can backfire. It's like having too much of a good thing. Some people have been listening to preaching. Some men have been going to church with their saved wife. 
they've been sitting through the sermons, they've been hanging around the church, they've been following some ministry or some minister for years, and they're still not saved. Go figure. It's hard for us to understand how that could be, but it is. It does happen. They hope to have more information, more of their questions answered. I want to get a little bit more information before I'm willing to commit. Like someone who only listens to liberal talk radio all day long at work. I work with someone like that. Or somebody who listens to only conservative talk radio all day long. I am that guy. <laughs> but they still can't decide who to vote for when it comes election day. When how much more information do you need? How many more questions do you need answered? Sometimes a multitude of counselors doesn't help. If you get spiritual counsel from somebody who doesn't believe in a perfect Bible, then you have good reason to doubt whatever they tell you. How many want, to, want your surgery to be performed by a doctor with only an honorary doctorate? <laughs> so you want to trust somebody who believes the book he's reading from cover to cover. Because he's, mo he's motivated by conviction and conviction by the Holy Ghost. The only way to get good counsel, the only way to, to have a godly vision is to keep your eyes focused on the word of God. Proverbs 29, 18 says, in the companion verse, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. That verse has been twisted and misused so many times. Well, we have a vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. We have a vision to build a new parking lot. We have a vision to build a new basketball gym. We have a vision to build a coffee shop on our church grounds, um, our holy grounds, right? We have, a new, we have a vision to do any number. We have a vision that our pastor needs to have his own private jet. We have a vision. That's the pastor's vision. That might not be everyone else's vision and so forth. But the vision is not you wanting to do great things for your own achievement. The vision is keeping your eyes on the Word of God. That's what you're supposed to focus your vision on. But beside the multitude of years, beside the multitude of words, beside the multitude of counselors, life also brings a multitude of sins. A multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And James 5, verse 20. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. This is a case where charity is a much better word than love. We think of 1 Corinthians as the love chapter. Everybody calls it. But charity is love being put into action for the saving of a sinner, for the sake of him turning from the sin of his life. Over your lifetime, you have received great charity from God because you've committed a lot of sin. Thank the Lord for every chance to repent once again. For every time your heart is softened once again. For every tear that can flow yet again. Thank God for those things. An old-fashioned cry can do you a world of good sometimes between you and God. It's because of the multitude of sin in your life. Psalm 19 verse 14 can be a very powerful verse for a growing Christian and a great prayer request as you start each day. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. But it's not just your words and it's not just your thoughts that bring about problems. It's also the tone in your voice. It's also the glance of your eyes. It's the gestures you make, the body language that's conveyed to people when you're talking to them. It's part of that conversation uh, someone else hears when you're on the phone. It's the things you laugh at when someone says something in the workplace. 
the things you listen to on the radio. It's the places other people see you go. All of those things play a part in inspiring goodness and purity with a clear conscience before God or damaging the work of the Holy Spirit in you. The Bible says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James 4, verse 17. Sin isn't just doing something bad. Sin is failing to do something good when you have the chance and you know you should. The Bible says, the thought of foolishness is sin. Proverbs 24, verse 9. If you plan on doing something wrong, trying to get away with it after work, before you have to go home and not tell anybody about it. The planning itself is sin, not just the act. If you're honest with yourself and honest with God, you have to admit that your life contains a multitude of sins. And that leads me to my last point. A multitude of sins can only be uh, fixed by a multitude of mercies. Point number five, a multitude of mercies. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And Psalm 5, verse 7. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Someone has defined grace and mercy this way. Grace is God giving you something you don't deserve. Mercy is what keeps God from giving you what you do deserve. The heading over Psalm 51 reads, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. He was an adulterer and a murderer, and he knew he deserved death. He deserved God's judgment on the spot. He deserved to be struck down. But God didn't do it. It was his mercy that kept him from giving him what he deserved. And the rest of Psalm 51 uh, turns out to be one of the greatest prayers of repentance found anywhere in the Word of God. It's a truly a blessing. When Israel would be subdued under the Philistines or under captivity, they would cry out to God in their misery. And we read, Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. Psalm 106, verses 44 and 45. Jeremiah knew that this is what was going on. And he wrote, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. Lamentations 3, verse 22. God made promises to Abraham to give his descendants, uh, to help his descendants to inherit the whole world one day. But that hasn't happened yet. And so the Jew survives because God still intends to fulfill his promises to Abraham when the Messiah comes back. His mercies in forgiving you, letting you live another day, letting you repent and get right with God, that ought to drive you back to church. It ought to drive you back into the Bible. It ought to drive you to build, uh, restore fellowship with God once again. And it ought to re drive you to maintain that fellowship as long as you possibly can. Now I'm going to bring this to a close. There are multitudes in your life that can stand in your way. But thank God for the multitudes of His mercies that can help clear the way for you to go through and get right with God and live in peace and joy and fellowship with God time and time again.